Praise you, Lord, I praise you. Oh, I praise you. Yes, I praise you. How I praise you, my precious Lord. I love you, Lord, I love you. Oh, I love you. Yes, I love you, Lord, I love you, my lovely Lord. You are worthy, Lord, you're worthy. So you're worthy, so worthy. Oh, you're worthy, most holy Lord. I have the joy of introducing Sister Kuruba. The way I would like to do it is just share a little bit from uh, her bio, from her website. Uh, I know she's been a tremendous blessing at the Walter Hoving Home, and also uh, we'd love to have her here too because uh, she flows with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And uh, it says here, um, Sister Karuba Stephen is the wife of Brother Pradeep. Amen, Brother Pradeep. And the mother of five precious children. She was born and raised in a godly home. In her early years, she was very close to her spiritually gifted <coughs> grandmother. Her grandmother went to be with the Lord on January 26, 1985. After this, Sister Karuba underwent a year of torment in which she could not sleep properly because of the fear of death. She was led to salvation by her mother on January 26, 1986, exactly a year later. At the age of 10, as she finally received Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Finally, you waited all the way till 10. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord removed the fear of death that had been tormenting her, replaced it instead with great joy and peace. The following May, she attended vacation Bible school, and the Lord blessed her with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Since then, she's been began to use... The Lord began to use her over the years in grade school and in college to bring many students from various religious backgrounds to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Sister Karuba received a BA in liberal studies from Sunny Purchase, New York, and a master's in childhood education and special education from Long Island University. She's currently pursuing the doctorate in organizational leadership at Regent University. Her greatest joy comes from worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. She happily shares the ministry calling with her husband in reaching out to hurting souls. However, she's a firm believer that a woman's first ministry is in the home. A godly mother should cheerfully take on the privilege and duty in meeting the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of her husband and children. Thus, as a family, they can serve the Lord. Amen. 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 Boy, that's a great introduction. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so let's give her a hand as she comes and ministers to her. So shall we just close our eyes and look to the Lord one more time? Father, we thank you, Lord. Jesus, without you, we can do nothing. Lord, it's vain, Father, if we gather together and you're not there. But we believe, Jesus, that you are here this morning because we are gathered together in your name and your presence is here, Lord. We ask you, precious Father, to break this bread and feed us. Lord, you know where we lack, you know what we need. We ask you, our Father, that you will flow through us, Holy Spirit, flow into us, Holy Spirit. Lord, may you spring, Father, never-ending spring, Oh, Father, flow into each one of these precious souls that are here. We come with our spirit, soul, bodies, and mind under the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And come against all the powers of darkness, every demonic spirit that's trying to take the word of God from the hearts of the people. Find those demons in Jesus' name. And come against every evil spirit that is trying to scatter the thoughts of your people. Bind them in Jesus' name. Take victory in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Lord, that you give them a single heart, a single mind. I pray that you anoint their ears to hear your word. Lord, give them open mind to receive your truth. Their hearts be as good ground, O Lord, to bring forth much fruit. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I was praying yesterday, asking the Lord what to share with you today, the Lord gave me this verse. It's, in, it's from Psalm 68, verse 7. Psalm 68, verse 7. God said it, the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. We see a contrast right here. God said, you know, in a different translation it says, God 
he takes the lonely and he puts them in families. So, God wants to give us a promise this morning. He says, do you feel lonely? If you feel lonely, God says, I'm here to put you in a family. God says, I saw Adam, he was by himself, and I took him, and I made a generation, many generations out of him. Our God is a God of multiplication. He makes something out of nothing, and that's what he did. He created a whole new person out of just a rib, a bone, a man. He's such an awesome God. He's such a great God. And that God is promising each one of you today. If you feel lonely in your heart, you say, Lord, I don't know what my future is going to be. I don't know where I'm going to be. The Lord says, here, take this promise. I'm going to put you in family. And, it, and you see two kinds of families here. One is the family of God, and two is the family on earth. The family of God is the universal family of Jesus Christ, where God says, I'm giving you this offer. I want to put you into my family. I want to adopt you into my family so that you can become a member of my family. God's word says, we were once afar off. The hand of Jesus Christ came, he sought us, and he bought us with his precious blood. And he says, I'm going to make you my own, and I paid you. I paid the price to redeem you, to make you my own. And he said, I'm putting you into my family. So if you have not really made the commitment to the Lord, this morning, think about that. Jesus comes and he offers you and he says, I want to put you in a family. And this family is not an ordinary family. It's not, okay, I'm putting you in an earthly palace, you know, maybe uh, in, uh, in a king's family, in a royal family. Maybe all of a sudden you've been transported into um, Queen Elizabeth's you know, family or somebody. God says he wants to put you into the king of kings and the lord of lords, the king of all kings, the lord of all lords, not just the earth, whatever planet, whatever is out there. He's over everything. And he's saying, I'm going to make you my daughter. I'm going to make you, I'm going to put you into that family. That's number one. Number two, God says, okay, I'm going to put you into my family. That doesn't mean that, okay, God is going to put you into an invisible family and that's it. And you're going to be a loner the rest of your life. God says, no. On this earth, I'm going to give you a family. So when you think, Lord, my family is scattered. Sometimes we think, Lord, I don't know if I'm ever going to get my family back, whether my family is going to ever want to be back. I know God is prophetically speaking. If that's you, the Spirit of the Lord says, just like how the Lord gathered the children of Israel from different parts of the earth, He says, can a nation be born in one day? The Spirit of the Lord says, I will bring your family back to you. Provided you stay in the family of God. There's a trade-off. We cannot be on the camp of the enemy, in the camp of the enemy, and then ask God for his blessings. That's not going to happen. God is not going to support his enemies. But if we say, Lord, I want to be in your family. I want to live in your house, abide by your rules, Lord, and live as your child. Then God says, look what I'm going to do for you. Two characters we're going to quickly go through in the Bible. Let's just turn to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Ruth 1, 16 to 18. I'm going to read it. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Now, if you don't know this story, I just want to give a short overview of the story. But there was a woman in the land of Israel, her name was Naomi, and um, she had a husband, she had two sons, and there was famine in the land of Israel, so she, she thought, okay, 
let me just make a smart move. Move from this place to a nearby country. And she went and settled in a heathen land, not trusting the God of Israel, not thinking, okay, this, these are God's people. I want to be with God's people. Whether I get food or not, I want to stay here. She didn't make that choice. She said, okay, I'm going to try to escape. I'm going to see where comfort is. I'm going to go over there. She went and dwelt in a foreign land and had her sons marry Moabite women. And Ruth was one of those women. And after a short time, she lost her husband. She lost her sons. Not to famine. I think if she would have stayed in the land of Israel, they would have done well because we see later, the Lord visited his people. When Naomi went back, God's people were doing well. She's going back, losing everything. In the process, we see, no, um, Ruth, one of the daughter-in-law, she says, I'm going to go with Naomi. Now, everything is new. She's coming from a totally different country, a different religion, different uh, upbringing. Everything is entirely different. She does not know anything about the God of Israel. She might have heard a little bit. That's about it. Her God was different. Her parents were different. Everything was different. But she makes a choice here. She said, I am going to follow the God of my mother-in-law. And she says, where she's going to go, that's where I'm going to go. Where she's going to stay, that's where I'm going to stay. Even if I don't know what place that's going to be, even if I don't know whether it's going to be comfortable or not, even though I have to leave everything I know from my childhood, I'm going to make the decision to go all the way, like we sang during the worship. Where he leads me, I will follow. Not Water away, not half, not even three fourths, all the way. When we look in the Bible, Jesus had 12 disciples, right? How many disciples actually stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was hanging? How many? One. one. Only one. And that one, he came and stood there, and Jesus was able to trust and trust his mother into his hands. What a privilege. And if we Make that commitment to the Lord today and say, Lord, no matter what it is, even if I have to come and stand at the foot of the cross, we will have the privilege of hearing Jesus speak to us. We will have the privilege of getting that gift from the Lord, that responsibility that Jesus can only trust those who will come all the way up to Calvary. We will not say, Lord, I'm scared. Lord, this is not comfortable. Lord, I'm going to take off. I'm going to be here until you give me, you bless me. When, you, when I see things like change a little bit, when I see famine on this side, I'm going to run to Moab. God cannot do much for those people. God will say, okay, you go. I will wait until you come, but I'm going to visit my people. We need to be like Moses. And Moses, even though he was in the palace in Egypt, he made a choice. He made a very clear choice to suffer for the people of God. He said, I'm going to leave discomfort. I'm going to leave this evil pleasure. I'm going to leave everything that I know since I was maybe born and brought up, maybe that's all he could remember in the palace. He said, I'm going to leave everything. I'm going to go and suffer with the people of God. With the knowledge that he had, whatever his mother told him, he held on to that. He made a choice. He had a choice to make. That's what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning. You have a choice to make. We're not exempt from making choices. We have a choice to make. A lot of times we say, Lord, I'm not able to really choose the right thing. I don't have the strength to choose the right thing. Ask the Lord, He'll give you the strength. But I want to tell you one thing. If you have the strength to choose something wrong, you do have strength to make a choice. You have to direct it in the right way. Channel it properly. Channel your energy, your emotions, your choices where it needs to be channeled, where you can actually gain. Because whatever choice you're making, it's an investment. It's an investment. Whether you're going to invest into something that's really going to give you a good dividend, or you're going to just throw money away in the sewer. We have that choice, right? Nobody can come and stop us saying that, yo, don't throw it. They can tell you, but nobody can block you, because you're going to end up saying, it's my money, my life, I can do whatever I want to, but who is the loser? We the loser. So 
The Lord, in His love and in His mercy, He comes to us and He says, My son, my daughter, you have a choice to make. That's what God's word says, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Whether you want to serve the God of heaven and earth, or whether you want to serve your own God, which is yourself. Whether you want to say, Lord, I want to bow down to you. And you want to say, Lord, I want to bow down to myself. Many of us, self becomes God. We don't need to have a big <coughs> statue like how King Nebuchadnezzar had and had Daniel and other people to bow down. A lot of times, our own self is sitting on the throne. We want to fulfill our desire. We want to fulfill our lust. We want to fulfill our passion. We want to fulfill our dream. We have our own dream. The Lord says, relinquish everything at the foot of the cross. Then I will give you a dream that's according to the heart of the Father which will fulfill the cry of our Heavenly Father. Do you know God cries? The heart of the Father is aching. He's aching for the perishing souls. Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but there are a lot more people who need to be one. His kingdom. Many are going to hell every day, in spite of Jesus shedding his glory. What are we doing? If we are consumed and worried about saving our own soul, what are we going to do to the rest of the people? That's what God's word says. Save yourself and you hear us. So we got to take care of ourselves first, right? We have to take care of ourselves first. When I spoke um, uh, at another place in California last week, I was telling the people, a lot of people falsely assess themselves. They think they're stronger. Prematurely go back to where they came from. Try to witness. That's what they The Lord told Peter, after you're strengthened, strengthen your brother. So we have to make the clear cut decision. Yes. I'm not going to have association with what I have oh, before. Yes. Unless the Lord tells us to. And it's very, very rare for the Lord to tell you to go back to the same place. Unless you're really strong and unless God has anointed you for that. Otherwise, if you go there, you become food for the enemy. He will swallow you up. But if you make a choice, say, Lord, more than me worrying about my friends who are in drugs or my friends who are in immorality, I'm going to worry about my soul. I'm going to protect it, guard it, but I'm going to pray for them. God knows who to send to them. God knows how to rescue them. You don't have to go there. And the Lord will mature you, he will strengthen you, and he will send you where he sees fit. So we should not just try to go thinking that, Lord, I'm strong. Sometimes, you know, it happens after a succession, a period of getting victory. We think that we'll be fine. Nothing is going to top of us. That's when we have to be extra careful. If the enemy knows, he knows, okay, you're confident, I'm going to come. When you don't pay attention, that's when you come. But if you are very cautious at all times and say, Lord, it's by your grace, it's by your mercy. I will follow you just like you said. I will be vigilant because the enemy is like a roaring lion going around. He knows I'm in the hand of God. But if I walk away looking at something, I will be swallowed. And we, have, we know the story, right? Like how a lot of the um, cows or oxen or whatever, a group of animals are there. As long as they're with the group, they're fine. But once one starts wandering off, it becomes a prey. You know, to the wild beast. So, the same way, as long as we are in the fellowship with the people of God, God has placed each one of you here, right? For whatever duration God has, make the most out of it. And say, Lord, I'm going to make the most out of it. I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to spend time in your word. I'm going to see what Jesus has for me. God has a plan and purpose for each one of you. He has a plan and purpose for each one of us. Are we in the middle of his plan? Are we in the center? So, if we want to know what his plan for us is, we need to read his word. The last time I came, I was talking to you about the importance of reading God's word. Unless we know the importance of reading God's word, we're never going to really read God's word. We're never going to give weight to what God's word says. If we know the word of God's word, if we know how valuable God's word is, it is our very life, it's our very breath. Without that, spiritually we will die. So that's how important God's word is. So when we say, Lord, I'm going to take the word of God, I'm going to take it as if I cannot live without it. Another 
breath and cannot breathe without it, then the Lord will look at us and say, okay, now you're meaning business with me. Now I'm going to talk to you. Now I'm going to give you grace. Grace is given to those who really mean business with the Lord and say, Lord, I'm desperate. Lord, get me out of here. I need your help. I need your strength. Not somebody who says, Lord, maybe, maybe not, maybe not, maybe I still like this. God will say, I will wait until you say, Lord, I don't want this. I want you. The Lord wants to do that. This morning, when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever it is, whether it's habitual lying, whether it's stealing, I don't know why the Spirit of the Lord is mentioning certain things, but as the Lord mentions, you know in your heart what is really going on in your life. What was really going on in your life before that you're still struggling with? You can be in a church, you can be in a Bible college, you can be in the most godly environment. If I don't change inside, it's not going to do anything. So we have to yield ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of the Lord comes, we have to yield ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit. Once the Lord showed me when uh, we were in prayer, a duck. Duck can go deep into the water, right? It can go deep into the water and can come back up without having a drop of water go into its body. We can be just like that in the same presence of God day after day after day after day after day. Not touched by it. Not a single word of God be done by it. You know why? Because we can completely cover ourselves with our own self. <laughs> But when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to completely lay myself at your altar. I want to completely get wet. That's the reason why I want to go inside the water. I want to really feel the presence of God. I want my mind to be renewed. Lord, I want whatever is hurting inside to be healed. Lord, whatever has been gripping my heart, I want that to be gone out of my life. When we come to the presence of God, expecting Believing, really meaning business with him, the Lord says. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. He comes and he breaks all the yoke that needs to be broken. And then the Lord says, now follow me. We cannot follow him with the baggage, right? We have to go to the altar and say, Lord, I want to lay everything down. And so Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are weary. And your burden with heavy, burden. That's who our Jesus is. He says, there's a song, right? I'm trading my sorrows. Yes. <clears throat> there's a trade-off. We have to trade off something. We cannot just say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to take this. I'm going to have this. We've got to give this to him. And then take. And last time I remember talking about the yoke. God's yoke is light. We need to lay the yoke that Satan put on us. Or we willingly gave our neck to Satan to put that yoke on us. We need to take that off. Then we have to willingly show our neck to the Lord and say, Lord, lay your yoke on me, Lord. That's what God wants. God will never force anything on anybody. God will never say, okay, oh, you're coming. I'm seeing you coming 10 feet away. Here, I'm going to throw the yoke on you. God won't say that. Willingly come to the Lord. That's what he says. I am knocking at your door. If you hear me knock and you open, then I will come in. God is such a gentleman. He never pushes into anybody's life, he waits. And he's such a loving father, he waits. So, we saw in the book of Ruth, how Ruth, even though she was a Moabite woman, she didn't know much about God. And some of you are like that, where you didn't have that much knowledge about God, you didn't know, you were not raised in a very godly home. The environment would have been completely different. But, you have some exposure. From Naomi, just like that in the Bible. We're given some exposure. Whatever light has been given to you, whatever amount that you know about the Lord, will you be faithful to God? Ruth made the choice. She didn't know much about God. Whatever was given to her, she said, I'm going to hold on to that. Naomi's God is going to be my God. Where she goes, I'm going to go. Where she stays, I'm going to stay. Her people are going to be my people, her God, my God. Shall we make that commitment to the Lord today and say, Lord, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Lord, where you want me to go, that's where I will go. Because I know 
Unless his presence goes with me, I'm not going to go. If his presence goes with me, then I will go. We need to remember, Jesus, when he went, and he stayed with the sinners, he went there as a physician. He went there as a physician. He was not a person with low immune going there, getting attacked. He was a physician. You have to remember that. So he went there as a physician to heal them, to deliver them. So we have to say, Lord, help me to become like you. Help me get that strength from you. And say, Lord, make me, mold me the vessel that you want me to be. And Ruth made that choice. So today, the first character we're seeing is Ruth. She made a choice to follow the God of Naomi. And God blessed Ruth for that. If you look at her life, God picked her and he made her mother of, who's that? Obed. And we see Ruth, even though she was a Moabite woman, her name is found in the Bible, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God placed her in a family. He just not only brought her into some family, he brought her into a very prosperous family, into the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God can do the same thing for you. God will not do something for you. God will always give you the best. We need to be patient. Work with the timing of the Lord. Work with the leading of the Lord. And one specific thing that the Lord brought me out to speak to you from the life of Naomi, and the next one, sorry, Ruth, and the next person is going to be Esther, is their humility and their yieldedness to follow what was told to them. If you look at Ruth, Ruth exactly followed what her mother and told her. She never said, oh, you're an old-fashioned lady. You don't know. You know, I'm young. I know what to do. You know, you stay at home. I'll bring you whatever you need to eat. She never did that. If you look at the Bible, there's the last verse I want to read from Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. Ruth 4, 5 to 6. She says, I will do whatever you say. Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. She not only told her that I will do. But you see her response, her action. She actually did everything, just like she told to her mother-in-law. So she was an obedient woman. What the Lord wants to speak to us this morning is, are you being obedient to the voice of God? Whatever the Lord speaks to you from His Word, are we obedient? Only the obedient will receive the blessing of God. If Ruth would have done her own thing, she wouldn't have been in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. She wouldn't have been married to Boaz. She would have ended up with somebody else, become an unknown person. But she made a choice to obey. She made a choice to humble herself and trust in the leading of her mother and mother. Same way, we need to humble ourselves and learn to trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit. Even if we cannot see, even if it doesn't make sense to us, if we say, Lord, if you would lead me, I will follow. To the unknown, I will follow. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do, Lord. And the Lord will definitely bless us. He'll put us in a family. God sees fit. He'll bring our family back. He'll put us in a family. God sees fit to give us a family. God will get the glory. I'm sure.